Hey guys, I'm very excited for another episode of Show About Science. This is your host, Nate. I'm very, very excited for another episode. My guest is Joe Hansen, the host of It's Okay to Be Smart. Let's get this thing started. He's super duper 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 smart, smart, smart. Hello. Hello. This is Joe. Is this Nate? Yes. I have been looking forward to talking to you. So, do you know any creatures' names that are extinct? I do. Actually, some of my favorite creatures around that I've ever heard of don't live anymore. Obviously, we have dinosaurs. I love dinosaurs. and Those aren't around anymore, like Pterosaurus rex, Stegosaurus, and all those. But there's also a lot like, um, have you ever seen a woolly mammoth? Uh, I've seen it in the field museum. Yeah, exactly. They've got really big ones there. The one of my favorites is called a giant sloth. Have you ever seen the sloths that live in the jungle today? The really slow animals that climb the trees? No, but I've seen pictures of them in shows. Well, a long time ago, thousands of years ago, actually, where we live in the United States, And all the way down into Central America and South America, there were sloths that were as big as a car. They could reach all the way up into the tops of trees. Those were part of the megafauna. Exactly. Megafauna. You know, we used to have a lot more big animals around, and a lot of them just disappeared. I mean, can you imagine if you went out hiking in the woods and you found a saber-toothed tiger? Oh, goodness. If I were a caveman... I would just run away so fast. Me too. It's not like a kitty cat. We would not want to try to pet that. Because of its colossal jaws. Exactly. I think they might be like 12 feet in diameter. You could stand up inside that. I don't think I would want to get anywhere near those jaws. (sighs) I know. Speaking of extinct animals... A lot of animals are going extinct today, and not the big ones, not these big megafauna, but really regular animals like frogs and a lot of insects and a lot of things like that. And uh, that's kind of scary because things go extinct all the time. It's just part of being alive. Some stuff goes extinct, but it seems to be going extinct faster than normal these days. And that's kind of dangerous for nature because it's what we call a maybe a mass extinction is going on. That means when a lot of things are going extinct at the same time, and we're not sure that that's such a good thing for nature. What do you think would happen if honeybees went extinct? Would it really sting? (laughs) That would really sting. You know, I like to eat honey. I had honey on my toast for breakfast the other day, and... I put it on granola when I eat breakfast sometimes too. Honey's really, really good, but we get a lot more than just honey from honeybees. So honeybees' favorite thing to do is to go out and find flowers, and then they drink the nectar, and then they collect this stuff called pollen, which is what plants use to make other plants. And honeybees are the most important way to get pollen from one flower to another so that they can make seeds and make new baby plants. And so many of the things that we eat, like apples and almonds and tons and tons of fruits, you know, most of the grocery store, actually, that when you go in and and buy groceries, so much of that stuff is brought to us by honeybees. They go out and do all that hard work for us so we can have fruits and vegetables. But Honeybees are kind of in trouble because farmers like to use chemicals on their plants uh, to keep other bugs away from eating them. And they used to think that these chemicals were safe for honeybees, but it looks like some of those chemicals are hurting the bees and it's making them hard for the bee colonies to survive. The beehives are dying. And That means that we might not have some of those fruits that we rely on or things like almonds, and that would be pretty sad. So luckily, scientists know this is happening, and they're keeping a really close eye on it. And they're going to say, 
maybe we shouldn't use some of these chemicals, or maybe we can help bees get stronger. I know that it has a name, colony collapse disorder. But what were the names that they've given it in the past? So it's happened before. Bees have a pretty tough time because it's hard being a bee. So sometimes they'll die off in winter when it gets cold, but usually when it gets warm again, they come back. And because of things like infections, like when we get sick, bees can get sick too. And, and all these chemicals, this colony collapse disorder is sort of when all of these things come together, the chemicals and being sick. And, and then sometimes that beehive won't come back when it's springtime. So scientists are hoping they can come up with a way to make those bees a little bit tougher and protect them from these chemicals so we can keep getting our food. Do you think that we could someday eradicate mosquitoes? Well, why would we want to do that, do you think? I heard that there's some pretty scary diseases out there that mosquitoes carry. You know, they bite us and, and those bites itch, but those go away after a while. But sometimes mosquitoes carry things like malaria, which is a really bad disease. And then there's a new disease that people are getting called Zika that just came out. And people think that that's carried by mosquitoes. And sometimes people die from these. So one idea is, well, could we just get rid of mosquitoes? And scientists have invented a few ways of doing this by sort of changing what we call the genes, the DNA inside of mosquitoes. And they think it might actually be possible. But what we don't know is if there would be some effect that we can't think of if mosquitoes disappeared. So we don't think there would be, but maybe mosquitoes do some really important job that we don't know about. And maybe it would throw nature off balance if we got rid of them, but maybe it wouldn't. So hopefully, uh, I know some scientists are going to do some really small experiments and they're going to get rid of mosquitoes in a very small area and they're going to see what happens. And that's how we do an experiment. So we can see if it has a positive or a negative effect. Why not just swat mosquitoes? when they land on us. Well, not all mosquitoes bite people. I don't know if you knew this, but the mosquitoes that bite you and, and want to suck on your, you know, they suck on our blood, but like, they're kind of like little vampires. Well, the only ones that do that are female mosquitoes from a few different types of mosquitoes. And some mosquitoes don't bite people at all. They might bite birds, or they might bite squirrels or mice. And male mosquitoes, well, they actually don't bite people at all. They eat nectar like bees do, and uh, they just don't even care about us. So some people think that, you know, there's a lot of animals out there that like to eat mosquitoes too, like birds or things that live in the water. So if we got rid of mosquitoes, maybe those things wouldn't have food. Or maybe there's a plant out there, a flower that really relies on mosquitoes. And that's why we just have to be careful and do experiments to see what the effect would be. Okay, Joe, let's switch topics. My favorite Joe video is basic. The, the It's Okay to Be Smart on the Game of Thrones. So how do the seasons get so crazy in the Game of Thrones? Oh, I love that show and all the books, and it is a crazy world. So Game of Thrones, you know, there's one really important season in there, and that's winter. And for you and me, you know, we, we go around every year, and it's summer for a while, and then a few months later it gets cold, and that's winter. And then a few months later it gets warm again. We have a nice little pattern. But it seems like in Game of Thrones, they go years and years and years and and then winter never shows up until all of a sudden it's winter, but then it's winter for like seven years at a time, which is, that's pretty strange, isn't it? Yeah. So we don't know because it's a book and it's a pretend world and we don't know. We don't know what's going on there, but some scientists have looked at the book and they have some ideas. And my favorite one, so, you know, earth goes around one star that we call the sun and it goes around that star every year. And that's what gives us the seasons because of how we move around that star. But some people think that in the game of Thrones world, they might orbit two stars. And one of those stars just might be so dark that they can't see it. 
And that means that the shape of their orbit, instead of being pretty much like a, a, we call ours an ellipse, it's like a circle that you squeeze a little bit so that it's shorter on one side. Well, they think in the Game of Thrones universe, it might just be crazy and spinning in this really weird way so that they get these really long winters. But it could also just be magic. I don't know. What would happen if dragons could exist? Well, I might be a little scared because I think dragons are kind of scary if they really did exist. Although, I like the dragons in Harry Potter better than the dragons in Game of Thrones. They seem nicer. I don't know how they would be able to fly, though, because flying is really hard to do. Humans can't fly by ourselves. We had to build airplanes to do it. So, you know what helps birds and bats fly? What? Is because they're so light. They don't weigh very much. Have you ever held a bird before? They're so light. It's almost like they're made of air. I've never held a bird before. Oh, you should try it. It's really cool. Don't pick up a bird outside. You should pick up like a pet bird. But they're really, really light because their bones are kind of hollow. And our bones are hollow. Theirs are, are hollow inside so they can save weight. And then their feathers are super, super light too. They feel really soft. So dragons though, they're really heavy. And I don't know how they would be able to lift themselves off the ground because big heavy things like airplanes, well, we had to build huge engines and big, big long wings to get those off the ground. And rocket ships, we had to attach huge, huge balls of fire at the other end to push them up in the sky. So dragons, I'm not sure that they'd be able to get off the ground, but there have been some really big things before that have flown. Like, uh, have you ever heard of pterosaurs? Oh, yeah, like Kensokawalis. Exactly. And that was really, really big. And it could fly, so... Yeah, it was the size of a giraffe. If the wings are big enough and they're shaped right, who knows? How can people find out about your show, It's Okay, Be Smart? So, Nate, I know that you're already a big fan of the show, but if anyone yeah. else wants to check it out, they can go to youtube.com slash it's okay to be smart. You can find it on Facebook and Tumblr and Twitter and all the places on the Internet talking about science every day, every week. Awesome videos. We'd love to have you around. Thank you, Joe, for being on the show about science. It's my honor. Nate, thank you so much for having me. I'm a big fan of your show, and I hope that you stay curious. There you have it, folks. The show about science is complete. Yeah, you can shut the recording off. For RJ and all of his other friends out there, here's a big shout out. I see, 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 I see. Cheers, cheers.